So we're back to UX design in board games here, examining ways in which different board games engage their players. I'm Adam Porter. I'm a professional board game designer with a number of games on the market and plenty more to come. In recent videos, I've been looking a lot at board games as products. So in this video, we're going to really focus closely on the user experience or UX of the gameplay itself. What are the key factors in the gameplay which cause players to engage? I've tried to break down the elements of gameplay which make me personally engage with a game. And this is what I've come up with in no particular order. The number one is thematic immersion. This can come from beautiful artwork, an intriguing new world, tactile components, or maybe just flavour text. But even better when a game puts you into a defined role and asks you to carry out actions which make you feel like you really are that person. Number two is meaningful choices. So these can be tactical, short-term, reactive decisions, or they can be longer-term strategic moves. But the key factor which makes a choice meaningful is whether it genuinely impacted on the outcome of the game. So a game with a lot of randomness might have plenty of choices, but ultimately the luckiest player wins the game. In that case, the choices are not meaningful. Meaningful interactions are harder to define. I guess it's something which makes you feel connected to the other players. What they do on their turn matters to you, and vice versa. And then we have challenge and stress. So the seeking system relates to a portion of the brain which drives us to explore and learn new things. And it's found in humans and in animals. Humans have a fundamental need to be challenged. And then we have feedback. So feedback is the manner in which the game rewards you for your actions and for overcoming challenges. So in my recent video about onboarding, I discussed the immediate feedback offered by the mobile game Candy Crush. It gives you points and visual displays and the handset vibrates and the dopamine hit which accompanies the feedback makes that game addictive and keeps the player coming back for more. In tabletop games, we want to see the effect of our choices, whether that's victory points or bonuses or special abilities or other rewards. The more immediate the feedback, the better. Now, most games are going to excel in a couple of categories and not so much in the others. So we're going to take a look at some examples. Cracks of Quedlinburg doesn't have much of a coherent narrative and it's very low on interaction. Your choices do matter, but they can easily be overwhelmed by bad luck. So they're only moderately meaningful. But the game is high on tension and consistently offers incredible feedback, whether you've drawn just the chip you wanted to gain a powerful combo or exactly the wrong chip out of your bag, causing you to go bust. You pushed your luck just one step too far. Witness is a cooperative puzzle solving game where you play as a team of spies and you have to whisper clues to each other and remember what you've heard to solve the case together. This is the sort of thematic immersion I really do enjoy. I know what my role is, it's very clearly defined, and the actions I do in the game, whispering and solving conundrums, make me feel just like the spy that I'm supposed to be emulating. The interactions are intense, you really do rely on the other players, and they're relying on you too. And the challenge is tough, it's easy to mess up, and that's going to lose the game for everybody. There aren't all that many choices to make in the game though, and there's no real immediacy to the feedback. You're just assigned points at the end of the game. Agricola involves a lot of strategic and tactical choices throughout the game. There's interaction there, but it's indirect. It's depriving other players, often by accident. The game is known for its tension, the struggle to feed your family at each harvest. And its immersion is pretty high. It's largely because of little tactile pieces in the game and the logical progression to the narrative. The feedback is not particularly immediate, your actions do take some time to pay off, but overall is a very engaging package. It seems that you can make up for a shortcoming in one area by excelling in another. So if we look at engagement as a ladder, depending on how well a game scores in one category, it's going to climb zero to three rungs on that ladder. So Las Vegas is an example of a game which I think balances all five areas without excelling in any of them. It's a dice game with plenty of luck mitigation, so the choices are moderately impactful. The theme is appropriate, but the artwork is pretty weak, so it's only moderately thematically immersive. There's a fair amount of player interaction, but you wouldn't particularly highlight that as a selling point of the game, and the feedback is not particularly frequent. You need to wait until the end of the round to determine who wins any money. But rolling the numbers you want on your turn is pretty satisfying. There's not a huge amount of stress and tension in the game, but every dice rolling game has some high stakes moments. So despite no standout features, Las Vegas almost makes it to the top of the ladder. A mediocre score in each category adds up to a really satisfying hole. 
The game Calico was number 9 in my top 10 of 2020. It's a tile laying game about building a quilt for cats to sit on. It's very puzzly. I was sold on the artwork and I liked the challenge of balancing multiple plans simultaneously to maximise your scoring. But over time I felt less and less engaged by the game. My choices seem to be less important than accidentally drawing the right tile at the right time. There's no real feedback offered on your turn and there's very little interaction with the other players. And as a result, Calico struggles to make it very far up that ladder. Now I'm aware that this game has been really popular, so if you've had a good time with it, firstly, that's fantastic, and secondly, I'd love to hear what it is that I've missed. What is it that's keeping you engaged with a game of Calico? Of course, no matter how rich and diverse your gameplay is, a designer or publisher can still scupper the chances of players engaging by providing a poor rulebook, fiddly components, poor presentation, or by just failing to meet the purchaser's expectations. If you make these mistakes, there is no chance of that game climbing up that ladder. This has been another short video, I'm afraid. My computer's playing up and it can't handle editing longer videos at the moment. But I hope it was useful and it's given you some things to consider when working on your prototype game. Maybe put it onto one of these ladders and see what it scores. Be honest with yourself about what the game is lacking as well as the areas where it excels and it might give you a direction of travel for further development of the game.